we, we were building a data conversion program. We needed to get the data out of SQL Lite, out of an SQL Lite database into SQL Server. The majority of this program is built, right? There may be a few refinements that we will encounter along the way. That's usually inevitable, but the majority of the program has been defined. Um, we have the structures in place to get data from SQL Lite to SQL Server. One of the refinements that I've identified right out the gate is the use of dictionaries, um, dictionary collections. And so what a dictionary collection uh, allows you to do is um, produce a, an associative array at a very high level. It's an associative array where it's a name value pair. And that name typically is a string, but it can be a numeric value, right? And the value side of that um, can be a, an integral value um, defined as a string or numer numeric type, or it can be a complex type. It can also be a collection in, in and of itself. And that latter um, definition is what I'm going for here in that uh, I found the associative uh, collections in .NET, primarily the sorted list uh, collection to be extremely valuable in writing software applications in the .NET arena. Um, for those who um, may know some C-sharp or some Java, but may not be familiar with all the libraries, but you may, let's say you know C++, um, what I'm talking about here is similar to the map type in C++, right? And so you have a you have an index key, and you have its associated value, and one of the benefits of that is twofold you boost the cache locality of data in your software application. And that is extremely valuable given the way that AMD and Intel designs their processors. Now, um, Apple M-series processors may have the same, same properties, but um, I am less read on that as of this time. And so, but for AMD and Intel based processors using the x86 instruction set. And I'm not a, I'm not a fan of x86. I'm not advocating for that. Uh, please do not take um, my, my statements as advocacy. They're merely uh, tangible examples that you can refer to um, in other references, in other um, areas of research. But the x86 instruction set and the way it's implemented in Intel and AMD processors um, and with speculative execution, and of course, speculative execution has its own issues, um, benefit greatly uh, or benefit the person using the computer and benefit the execution of programs uh, through ca various caching mechanisms. And so uh, cache locality, and locality of reference, uh, those are concepts that um, show, show real tangible, uh, real world value when it comes to performance. And so I use the sorted list on that basis in order to enhance not only the accessibility of data in memory, right? Let me say that again, the accessibility of data in memory. How accessible is your data? How much work do you have to do in order to get at that data, right? And I know I could take that discussion in uh, other directions such as uh, language integrated query link and and that sort of thing but at a fundamental level using fundamental uh, complex types how accessible is your data in a list type or even a basic array versus a type like a sorted list and I would say that although there is a, a, a balancing line in terms of complexity when using sorted list that it weighs more favorably in a direction of greater convenience, but also good performance if you use it the right way. And just like you would use the reserve keyword in uh, C++ to help with allocations, you can do something similar to that with sorted lists, for example, and with the, um, the generic list type, um, list T in Microsoft.net, right? I actually don't demonstrate that here because the amount of data that I'm dealing with is is of not a, is not of a level um, where that is actually necessary. But I've written programs that that has dealt with gigabytes of data, 
and was able to process, process that data in seconds based on how a collection type like sorted list is utilized. And so not only do you get the cache locality um, benefits out of the sorted list, but you get the best of both worlds in that you get um, sequential access, you get keyed access so that your iterations through the sequential type is greatly reduced and that reduction can occur in a multitude of ways through an indexer, uh, th through an indexer, through a type indexer, which is pre predominantly how I use it, or if you use the functions that are attached to or that are implemented on the um, dictionary interface that Sorted List uses, as well as its own native interface, you benefit from binary search, indirectly uh, benefit from bina binary search, as well as other um, relevant data index methods based on the amount of data that is um, that is that resides in the backing store for the sorted list and so that is the uh, those are some of the general reasons why I use sorted list and while why you will see it uh, throughout these examples so the main goal here is now that we have the data conversion in place and uh, we have our process nearly ready to go. Uh, the focus here is now to uh, test this program. We want to test, we want to verify it. We want to see if we're headed in the right direction on this. And once we do that, um, we are within closing distance uh, in, t in getting to our next objective, which is to write the graphical user interface application. And so um, I say this kind of tongue in cheek because um, it's not 100% true, but it, it can be very, very relevant in terms of a powerful software development process. The command line, okay, the command line precedes the use of data and console and command line programs precede and that work on data precede high quality graphical user interface applications in that order right so if you do it that way you're going to be much more successful but, but let's let's uh, get to where we are now with this console application this command line it's a, essentially a command line application but we are running it through Visual Studio, which is automating the, the um, invocation of the command line and then the invocation of this program so that we can test out the actual uh, programming sequences that access the data in ways that we want in order to get the data into SQL Server. In the previous video, we were adjusting the to string method, overriding it so that it brought back more information about the object instance that's in the collection. And what this does is it allows us to use the Visual Studio debugger and visually inspect the items that's in a collection and see those items in terms of the data that we're interested in rather than the type of object that's being represented. With the object instances, the collections that refer to RSS feeds and the associated articles for each feed, I want to be able to conveniently access them when working with them in code. And one of the ways that I can do that is by using a sorted list type. The sorted list type, it allows us to have a name value pair relationship that I mentioned in the introduction to this video. To explain that a little further, basically each feed has a name. And when we are 
accessing different uh, feeds in the form of a tab in this case, we want to be able to use that name to quickly get to the associated feed information. And using a sorted list allows us to do that where in our own code we don't have to use for loops to continuously loop through a collection or an array of these feed objects and using the equal signs to evaluate whether that uh, feed name in that object instance is equal to the value that's being referenced from the tab that's been clicked. And so the sorted list is going to do this for us automatically, do it internally. And it's going to use a variety of algorithms and internal data structures to accomplish this in a more efficient manner than would be productive for us to implement in our own code. And the same with the feed articles. And so we want to be able to find the feed articles uh, for a given feed and then when we are listing out these articles on the user interface, we want to take the headline, right, and we want to be able to find the associated article information for that headline. And so that's how these collection types, these dictionary types in particular, assist us in doing that there are different ways we can go about using these dictionary objects to organize the data. As you saw earlier, I had declared two variables, feeds and feeds articles, right? And so I could access both feeds and feeds articles uh, from those two variables. But I had a second thought and I decided that for each feed object instance, I want that object instance to contain the feed articles that are associated with that feed. I would still use the dictionary object instance for the feed articles for the reasons I just said, but it would be more convenient in this particular process to access the feed articles through the feed by way of object composition. And so that's uh, what I have done here. And then I want to um, refine the, the code that had uh, the two variables and just have only the one variable for the feeds. So this way I can um, have one object instance to worry about at the um, root of my, my code hierarchy and then I can uh, work through its the derived data uh, from there. The update feeds uh, function is going to be modified uh, so that I'm passing in the dictionary collection. This would allow me to uh, conveniently modify the, the feeds um, and do it through object passing, through message passing, right? And so in this way, I'm going to construct a data transformation process that doesn't require too much boilerplate code and do it in a way where the code is easy to evaluate and modify in fewer places. As I go through the data from SQLite and induct that data into the dictionary collection, I need to know if that data has already been added to the collection. And yes, it does feel like at times that wouldn't be the case if you're reading the data line by line, but in any data-driven process, which is nearly all the code that you will ever write when you write code, there should be some validations. 
I don't have extensive validations in this example. Validations is an entire series of videos and a topic all on itself. But you should have some minimum control checks as you are extracting data and or inducting data into a data destination. And so here I want to know if the data already exists. And so that's what um, we accomplish here through our control checks. And so I'm going to continue to refine these functions, these methods, um, the, the words, let's use them interchangeably, um, with the, um, the dictionary type that I'm using, the sorted list type, and its particular declaration um, on earlier in the code, and use that use object instances of that um, of that declared type to modify uh, the data that is um, accumulated in memory, and that then would be inducted into an SQL Server database. The control checks are in place for the feeds, the feeds import. Now I need the control checks for feeds articles. So on line 177, 178, that's where I'm going to put the control checks for feeds articles. And you've seen quite a bit of scrolling earlier, and that's just to build up my short-term memory with the design pattern that I just applied to feeds and I want to apply that same pattern, that same coding uh, approach to feeds articles. One of the things that I strive for in the code that I write is, um, I, I don't want to use the, use the word perfection, but I want to say that I, I strive for a very high uh, degree of consistency. So I want, I really want the codes to look the same. And so, and there have been projects I've worked on where, you know, no matter what part of the code base you look at it, one part of code base looks like any other part of code base. And that is, um, you know, uh, reaching for a level of uh, genericity, you know, gen having a generic uh, structure to the code so that it is, it is far more malleable and um, um, changeable to circumstances and to changing requirements and situations. And so, um, and so that's what, um, that's just a little bit of what um, I, I strive for here. And, but as idealistic as that sound, the way I'm going about it here is, a, in a, is in a much more practical way, much more brutally practical way. I'm not exactly copying and pasting, but I, um, um, on the on the verge of doing so, and I say that to say that um, I could write an entirely generic um, uh, uh, function, uh, library structure, you name it, that would handle all of this. Um, I could strive for other coding methods to do that, but in this particular exercise, I want to use a um, a particular uh, conventional approach. Let's go with conventional. Um, so a conventional approach to coding that uh, is not too elaborate and not too um, what some would consider excessive in terms of form and, um, and organization, right? But is still clean and still um, understandable and um, easy to um, produce, concoct, and iterate under in terms of modification. Here I am wrapping up this particular coding exercise with aligning all of the overloads of update feed articles so that the, the object definitions that are passed in correspond across the uh, overloads, at least the, the first parameter. I want to inspect the data in the SQLite database. I want to 
have a good understanding of uh, what the data looks like currently so that when I run the code or I run a sample of the code or I run a code on a sample of the data that I understand uh, what I'm looking at and I understand whether or not the extraction from SQLite is accurate and am I retrieving the correct number of records? Am I retrieving the records in the correct positions? You know, and so as careful and as meticulous as we have been in this process, there's still room for error. There's always room for error, but we want to narrow that down to near as zero as we can. And so here I want to know how many records we have uh, based on the, the feeds that are in the database. And it's good to have a working knowledge of that or have that information written down somewhere when you have a snapshot of the database. That is, the database is not in production and the values are not going to change uh, that often. And that allows you to um, get the defect rate the defect level of your of your extraction code down to um, an acceptable level, which in this case we will get it down to zero at some point. So um, here I, I see that we do have a number of records per feed, and um, I'm looking across the different databases: the the uh, first version of the database and the second version of the database, and I will be importing both versions right simultaneously. And so the, the numbers will uh, converge, so it will be a sum of the, the records from uh, each database. And so when I run this uh, code, when I run the program in Visual Studio, and I look at the, the counts, right, um, they should correspond uh, roughly to the sum of the records from both databases. Ars Technica, for example, the Ars Technica record or feed, it um, shows 78 records in the uh, first database and it shows 20 records in the second database. And then when I um, hover my mouse over that, um, that representation in Visual Studio, I see that there are 97 records. And so the sum of records um, would be 98, but we also want to account for uh, duplicates. So there may be a duplicate um, record between the databases. And so um, the code that was written, um, it actually filters out duplicates on data import. And so 97 would be the accurate number of records between the two um, databases. And as we go down the line, we see we have records from uh, BBC, DistroWatch, uh, Linux Kernel, MSN, and so on. Um, just know that some of these feeds are not active. They're marked inactive in the database. And so um, they will, those inactive records, they will not be imported. And so uh, tech rights, for example, that's going to be one of them. Um, though that's a that's marked inactive, an inactive feed, and so it uh, its records will not be imported, so it will not be properly represented um, in the debugger when we evaluate the numbers for it. I see that we have six total feeds imported. And there are more than that um, listed in the um, command line window. And so, again, some of those feeds are um, not eligible for import into the database. I'm going to continue to inspect the records and the, the representation in the C-sharp program. And then after a few minutes of that um, in the debugging and resume the next part of this 
data extraction from SQLite to SQL Server.